Our message tonight is entitled Fitness for the Crisis. You know, we are really living in a time where the decisions that we have to make are not only decisions that have an effect upon our temporal lives, but they're decisions that have a weight upon our eternal life. And we're going to see, as we've already seen before, that the devil is going to come with great deceptions, marvelous deceptions, that unless we have uh, the assurance and, and understand the importance of making the Bible our foundation, in fact, it says that we're going to be blown away by every wind of doctrine. And so I'm thankful tonight for the Word of God, aren't you? I'm thankful that we can come and trust and believe in what God has said. You know, it reminds me of what Jesus had to go through when he faced the enemy in, uh, in the wilderness. Remember how the devil came to him with the multiple temptations and Jesus never argued with him. Jesus never said, this is who I am and I'm greater than you are. Jesus always met the enemy on his own ground when it is written. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So Christ knew where the power lies. He understood how we are to overcome. And he also had a clear mind. Jesus had to discern what the devil brought to him that day. He said, if you are the son of God. So Christ had to have a clear mind, right? And we know that when he stood before Pilate and he stood before Caiaphas, he had to understand and had to have a clear mind when he was up against the powers that be. This is not the only time that we read in history where the Bible says that his own people had to do the very same thing. Come with me to Revelation chapter 13. And notice in this chapter, we find the Antichrist revealed here. And we also find in this chapter how the Antichrist is going to seek to deceive the very elect in the very end of time. Many will wonder and worship after this beast because they will not see the importance of following the Lord Jesus Christ and putting their word, his word in their life first. So Revelation chapter 13 and beginning in verse 1, it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seed and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Now again, here we're finding the world at large. In comparison, the majority will be found worshiping this beast. Now drop down to verse 8, and notice God has a verse here that implies something that is an encouragement to all of us today. Look at verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Thank God for this verse. Amen. In other words, God will have a people that will have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. For it says those who do not have their names written there, it says many of them are going to wander and worship after the beast in the last days. Now, as we look at Revelation 13, remember that beast that's coming up out of the earth having two horns like a lamb and the Bible says it's going to speak as a dragon. We know that this depicts the rise of the United States of America. Those two horns like a lamb represent republicanism and protestantism, a church without a pope and a state without a king, separation of church and state. But the devil knows that this great, great nation of ours is a refuge of freedom, right? He knows that it's based upon Christian principles, that is. And so many people are coming from around the world so they can worship according to the dictates of their own conscience. So the devil is going to try to exploit that. He's going to try to make something good bad. It's going to speak as a dragon. And so notice in verse 13, the Bible says here, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast." saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So economic sanctions is clear, it's evident will be brought the bear upon the rib of the people of God. Those who put Jesus first, they cannot buy and sell at all. Every earthly support will be cut off. Our only trust will be in Jesus Christ himself. But notice here that there's going to be an image that's going to be set up. 
And everyone's going to be commanded around the world to bow the knee to the, to the image that's going to be set up. And if you don't worship the image, the Bible says, of course, then you're going to be ostracized, you're going to be persecuted, economic sanctions, and eventually there will be a death decree. This is going to be a time of trouble the world's never seen before that we read about in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. Now, notice, friends, that this is not the first time in history that we find this. Remember the Bible says whatever things were written aforetime, they were written for our learning and were examples upon whom the ends of the world are come. So history will indeed repeat itself. We know back in the days of Daniel, there was another image set up, a golden image from Nebuchadnezzar on the plains of Dura, right? And then everyone would hear the sound of the music. They were commanded to bow the knee to this golden image. And of course, when everyone began to bow the knee, there was only three young men, a remnant, if you please, that said, no way, we're going to put the Lord first. We don't need a second chance. And he says, God is able to deliver us. And if he chooses not to, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not bow down to your idol, your image. Amen? And when they stood up for God, did God stand up for them? They were thrown into the fiery furnace, and God preserved their life. He sustained them. And Nebuchadnezzar says, I don't see three men. No, no. I see how many? Four. And the fourth is like the Son of God. So Jesus kept them from the power of the enemy. And in the last days, he alone will keep us and sustain us from the power of the enemy. He will be our refuge, if you will. Now, friends, why did a lot of the believers in Daniel's day, why did the Hebrews, who were many in number, slaves in Babylon, bow the knee when they knew better? The Bible says, He that is faithful in that which is least will be faithful in that which is much. And so they begin to bow the knee. And I'll tell you why. Because they compromised their faith, did they not? They thought if they would just bow the knee that nobody would really see, God would not care. And so they compromised in little steps here, a baby step here and there, until eventually their faith went out the window. And when the test came, they buckled under the pressure. But these three young men who stood up faithful, notice the test that came to them first. Let's go to Daniel chapter 1. And notice what happened to them in Daniel now chapter 1. This is the introduction to the book of Daniel. It's a story of faithfulness in the little things. Notice beginning in verse 4, Nebuchadnezzar chose Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel as wise men, choice young men from Israel. Look at verse 4. Children in whom was no blemish but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace in whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were among the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Meshach, and Azariah. And of course their names were changed in verse 7, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Daniel was given Belshazzar. But notice here that the king provided their room and board, and he also provided the spread. He gave them food and drink and nourishment so that he could train them in the schools of the Babylonians. And so I want you to understand the test that Daniel was facing. So food is brought out, and notice what Daniel purposed in his heart. Look at verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now that's a very big test, isn't it? Now imagine if you were invited to the White House and the president wanted to uh, honor you as a citizen of the United States of America. You were a guest of honor, so he brought the best food out there. And imagine if you saw something on the table that you knew was dishonoring to God. It would hurt the temple of God, your own body, and God would, wanted you to abstain from that. Now, would that be a test, friends, in front of all these executives? Yes. Daniel's life was on the line. And yet, it says, he purposed in his heart. What do you say? He was faithful, wasn't he? Now, the Bible says that he requested that the, uh, the butler or the cook would provide a different type of food for him, and he provided a different type of food. And so um, the Bible says that after so many days, Nebuchadnezzar tested him, and he found Daniel and his friends ten times wiser than the other wise men of Babylon. Ten times wiser. Now, friends, what did Daniel see that he knew, biblically speaking, that God said, don't even touch it, don't even consume it, don't even get near it because it's not healthy for you. What was it that he saw? 
Well, let's go to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 23. Let's look at one or two things here. A number of things we'll look at tonight. Our topic tonight is fitness for the crisis. How can we be fit and have clear minds for the test that's coming to every living soul in these last days? Notice beginning in verse 29 of Proverbs chapter 23. It says this. It says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? And who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? The answer comes back in verse 30. They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. He says in verse 31, he says, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and your heart shall utter perverse things. There's no doubt he's talking about the fermented wine, the alcoholic beverage that alters the mind, desensitizes the senses of the brain and the body. And then we become in time an easy prey for the enemy, right? He says, should we partake of it? Don't even look at it is what the wise man says, Solomon right here in Proverbs chapter 23. Now in the Bible, listen now, there is the word wine. And we find good wine and we find bad wine. Now the Bible gives us the, the privilege of discerning in the context of what God is saying. In fact, let's find out what the good wine is first. Let's go to the book of Isaiah now. Chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64, and notice where we find the good stuff, okay? Actually, chapter 65 and verse 8, just one chapter over from 64. Look at Isaiah 65, verse 8. It says, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sakes, that I may not destroy them all. So the good stuff is found where? right in the cluster of the vine. That is the unfermented grape juice from the vine. This is the good stuff that God made. In fact, you can read in the book of Timothy where Paul's writing to this young minister. He says, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. He was having stomach problems, right? And he was taking that from the very principle found here, that there is healing properties in what God has made to be good. Good grape juice that God has made. And so there's the good wine, but notice, friends, there's also the bad wine. Let's go to Joel chapter 1, verse 5. Joel chapter 1, verse 5. This is going to be in the Minor Prophets, after the book of Daniel, Hosea. Then you'll find the book of um, Joel. Joel chapter 1, verse 5. And notice it says, for a nation, I'm sorry, verse 5, Awake ye drunkards and weep, and how all ye drinkers of what? It, just, it simply says of wine. But notice the context of the type of wine we find in this verse. It says, and how you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. You see, God is saying, you're not drinking the stuff that I made, right? The grape juice. You're drinking the, the fermented ju juice, which produces alcohol. This is altering the behavior. It's altering the mind. It's wearing down your body. And the Bible calls them, you know, drinkers of wine and drunkards, etc. Now, sometimes people say, well, Brother Jason, what about that first miracle that Jesus performed? Remember the wedding feast of Cana? where Jesus turned the water into what? Into wine. He, was, he had just come out of the wilderness. His mother was orchestrating the wedding Mary. And of course, weddings back in those days were not just three hours like they are today. Weddings were about a week or two, often even longer, because the family would have to travel great distances. And they would come and get to know the other family, and they needed time. And there would be festivities, there would be lots of food and drink, etc. And so this lasted at least a week or two. So at the end of the wedding, they ran out of wine. And so there was a, a panic. And then Mary came to Jesus. What do we do? He says, listen, tell them they take these pots, fill it with water. And what does she say? What he says, do it, right? She knew exactly who he was. And so they did it. And Jesus turned the water into what? Into wine. And the governor drank it and said, hey, they saved the best for last. Now just imagine if it was alcohol. Here they are drinking for two weeks, right? They're all drunk. And then would Jesus come and make more alcohol when the Bible says, he that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things, right? That's what God's word says. Jesus would not do that. Let me tell you why. When he makes something good, is it good? You better believe it. Now, when you're on a budget and you have to go to the grocery store and you like to buy that 
frozen concentrated grape juice or orange juice, right? And you have to squeeze it out of that little can and it plops right there into the jug and you fill it with water. You have to reconstitute it. You have to stir it and stir it and stir it. And finally you get some orange juice or grape juice and then you drink it. It tastes okay, right? It's okay. It's sweet. But is there any comparison when you have freshly squeezed grape juice or orange juice? It doesn't even compare. You understand? Imagine Jesus turning the water into wine. Of course he's going to make it good. And that's why the governor said that. Now let's go to the book of Mark chapter 14 and read what Jesus said about his own blood. Notice the illustration or the comparison he gave in Mark chapter 14 verse 23. It says this. And he took the cup and when it had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, this is my blood of the New Testament or the New Covenant, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I would drink no more the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus said, listen, the, the grape juice that they were drinking is of the fruit of the vine. He goes, I won't drink it until I drink it with you in my father's kingdom, right? He's not talking about the alcoholic beverage. He's talking about the new wine, which is the grape juice of the vine. Why would Jesus ever associate his unadulterated, precious blood that he shed on Calvary's cross for our redemption with alcohol? And yet Proverbs 31, chapter 23, verse 31, says that this alcoholic beverage bites like a serpent. Just the opposite of what the lamb represents, right? Just the opposite. Now you're thinking right now, Brother Jason, what does this have to do with us today? Well, let's talk about some of the statistics that we can see with our own naked eye today. 95,000 deaths per year directly linked to alcohol consumption. 43 million per month in medical expenses, lost work and auto accidents. Notice this, the Washington Post says 35% of all hospital beds in America contain people who are there because of alcohol related problems. Look at this, 40% of all suicides, 54% of all violent crimes, 60% of emergency admissions, 80% of domestic disputes. Imagine, there's two things the devil hates. He hates the law of God, right? And he hates marriage. Because marriage is a symbol of the love that should exist between Christ and his church, right? And so the devil always tries to break families apart. And so notice, 80% of domestic disputes is directly linked to alcohol consumption. I can testify to that. My parents were divorced when I was very young. Uh, my father uh, was an alcoholic. Uh, even to this day, he does a lot of drinking of alcohol. It's tearing him apart. And it de basically destroyed our family. So I know from, from experience the effects of alcohol. Sometimes people say, well, Brother Jason, listen. My doctor said one glass of red wine is good for my blood. You know, my heart. You really think it's the alcohol that's good for the blood? You know who's sponsoring the commercials that are promoting that? The wine galleries in California. Do you know what's actually good for your blood and your heart? It is the grape juice from the vine that God said himself in the word of God, amen? That's what's helpful for us, not the alcohol beverage. There's no alcohol that's any helpful to anybody today. Our minds, our bodies, not at all. Leading cause of death from ages 16 to 24 years of age, of course, alcohol consumption. Car accidents, number one cause of death from ages five to 35, over 50% is alcohol related. Over 50% of all fatalities and wrecks of two cars or more are alcohol related and over 65% of single car wreck fatalities are alcohol related and 36% of all adult pedestrian accidents are alcohol related. Now, what does God say about the importance of what we put into our bodies? Let's go to 1 Corinthians now. 1 Corinthians chapter, I believe it's going to be chapter 10 and verse 31. Yes. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And here we find verse 31. It says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Amen? So the Bible says we need to be discriminating. We need to choose what is right over what is wrong. The Bible says whatever you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Now there's something else that many Americans and people around the world are consuming on a regular basis. And it's taking the lives of millions and millions of people today. And it's a narcotic. It ends in I-N-E. And it's called nicotine, right? Nicotine is a lethal killer. It really is. Many people are consuming it. Though they don't die overnight, many people are dying today. Tobacco products. This is U.S. News and World Report. 
kill more than 700,000 people each year. That's more than the combined deaths due to AIDS, car accidents, alcohol, illegal drugs, suicides, and fires. You can see that is the result of lung cancer. Someone who has died of lung cancer, their lungs are just scarred and charred from all the nicotine that's going inside. Now, sometimes people say, well, Brother Jason, where do we find in the Bible thou shalt not smoke or dip or consume nicotine? Well, the Bible doesn't say it in these words, but there's one that's just as good. Let's go to Deuteronomy now, chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. It's going to be back in the Old Testament. And here the principle is implied. That's right. The principle is there. So Deuteronomy 28, actually chapter 29. Let's go to chapter 29 and let's look at verse um, 18. God is leading his people out of Egypt to the promised land. We know this. And God is instructing them. He says, don't turn to the right or the left hand because there's distractions. And once you get distracted, he says, there are temptations out there that will lure you away from me. And notice one of the temptations out there. Look at verse 18. God says, lest there should be among you a man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away this day from the Lord our God. To go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. Now, isn't that interesting? God says, your heart may be taken away from me, turn away from me, family, tribe, individuals. He says, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall or wormwood. Now, if you look in the marginal reference, you know what it really says, that word gall and wormwood? It says here in my Bible, or a poisonful herb, right? God says, don't consume what? Poisonful herbs. Are there poisonful herbs out there? Of course. Is nicotine one? Let me tell you, if you took the, uh, the nicotine out of one pack of cigarettes and you put it in your bloodstream, you'd die. Because they have the filter on the cigarettes, you know, it filters out the nicotine that hits your lungs. I know I used to smoke for several years. I understand the power of the temptation, but I also have experienced, by God's grace, his power in my life. And I know that he's no respecter of persons. He loves us all, doesn't he? He doesn't judge us or condemn us. He loves us. He'll meet us where we are. Sick habits like chains of steel, but he will liberate us from these habits. If we allow him to come into our life, he will give us the victory. You know, my grandfather and my grandmother died of lung cancer at a very young age. My grandfather was 62 years old. 62. My grandmother was about 81 when she passed away with lung cancer. I remember when I was a little boy, my mother took in my grandfather for about two months before he passed away because he was just basically losing so much weight and strength, and his days were numbered. And we used to sit on his lap, and he'd play games with us, and he'd just sit there and cough and cough. And one day, he was just literally skin and bones, and he was having chest pain, so she rushed him to the emergency room, and she went in there, and they put him on the table. And as he began to talk with her, he just began to weep because his whole life was raced before him. And he said, Joan, my mother's name is Joan, he said, I can't see any good in my life. He wasn't a Christian at the time, but he says, do you think that Jesus will accept me right here and right now? Do you think? And of course, you know her answer. Of course, Dad. She wept with him as she saw him die, as she told the story. So she prayed with him. He gave his life to the Lord. But I want you to know something. Even though I believe he'll be in God's everlasting, I believe it. I really do. There's still cause and effect, right? Whatever we sow, that shall we reap. And so all his life, you know, he was a smoker. He didn't put him away. And so he developed, by cause and effect, lung cancer. And he rolled his head to the side, and before his heart stopped, this black cancerous stuff came rolling out of his lungs, out of his mouth, to the floor, and then he died. It was horrible to behold. My mother was just so distraught, so brokenhearted, because she was really close to her father. But I want you to understand that it's a real thing. And that the Bible says, in fact, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and notice how God expects us to look at our bodies. How does he expect us to view our bodies in light of the atonement? You know, when Jesus died, the sacrifice that we see on the cross, God in the flesh, the infinite God who never had a beginning, right? Jesus is, is God in the highest sense. He's divine. His sacrifice is an exhibit of the worth of one person. So when God would die on the cross, he's showing us how much he values every one of us. You understand that? 
And so when we don't value ourselves, what we're really saying is we don't value the atonement. We don't put a lot of, 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 of stock and value in what Jesus did for us. Now look here at 1 Corinthians now, chapter 3, and notice it says here, in light of what I just shared with you, look now at verse 16. Chapter 3, verse 16. He says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So God says, you belong to me. You don't belong to yourself. You're bought with a price. Your body is a temple. I want to live in you. And if Jesus lives in us, he will lead us to live the life that he lived. He will not lead us to destroy the body. And let me tell you what happens. The devil knows how human nature really is. He knows in the end of time when we can't buy and sell, when we have to have the things that, to supply these habits, that we will not have the faith like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to stand up when the image will be set up in the last days. So like puppet strings, he connects us to the world so that when we have to have these things, he simply pulls, right? And we will just buckle under the pressure that's coming, the economic sanctions, but God every day wants to give us victory so that we can head into that time experiencing the grace of God in our lives so that we can say, God has never forsaken me in the past. I know he's given me victory because I didn't have the strength to overcome what I have overcome. And I know that he will not fail me today. Amen? That's the faith we have to develop. Not faith in Christ, but the faith of Jesus Christ, as it says in Revelation 14 and verse 12. We have to have strong faith, believing in the word of God. Now let's look at chapter 6. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. It says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? And then he says, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so we can see without the Bible firsthand that it contributes to heart disease, strokes, various forms of cancer, emphysema, premature births, poor circulation, and of course, shortness of breath. Now there's another narcotic that's not as strong as nicotine, but nonetheless, is it harmful for our bodies? Yes, it's a stimulant. And of course, caffeine is found in many beverages that are consumed by many people today. And of course, people drink them because it gives them a temporary fix, a, a, an energy, a boost, if you will. But I'm going to tell you exactly what happens. I'm not a medical expert by any stretch of the imagination. There's some that are here that are, could probably give you a better uh, idea of what we're talking about here. But it's highly addictive. Overstimulates the nervous system, consistent, uh, contributes to cancer, raises blood sugar, irritates kidneys, contributes to cancer of the urinary tract. Now, you're going to get a laugh out of this because I'm just a little guy up here right now. But about 23 years ago, I used to be a competitive bodybuilder. I used to compete in North Texas, right here in Dallas, Texas. In 1995 is, was my competition there. And I, could, I had a certain diet intake. I had to have 60, 30, 10%, 60% carbohydrates, 30% protein and 10% fat, and I had to drop the fat to get in shape. And I couldn't have sweets, and I love sweets, so I couldn't eat them. And, I, and so I would go buy Diet Coke. Zero calories, you know, they advertise, right? So I would sit there and drink like, I don't know, seven or eight of them a day, just sit there and, and, and drink up Diet Coke because I got my sweet fix by doing that. But when I became a Christian, I did a little research and realized, you know what, this has a lot of caffeine in it. It's not really good for my body, so I'm going to just decide to give it up. Little did I know how addicted I was to the caffeine. I got massive headaches. It took me about three weeks of juicing, drinking tons of water before it got out of my system and the headaches began to stop. They subsided. Why? Because I was willing to do what it took, right? To overcome it by God's grace, of course. And I'm telling you, friends, today people are dying every single day. These energy drinks that people are drinking, these kids today... I heard of a woman that drank three liters of Dr. Pepper and she died. She was about 26, 28 years old. Very young. Three liters of um, Dr. Pepper. That's a lot of caffeine, isn't it? These energy drinks right now, they're just, I mean, bladder cancer, neurological disorders, increases blood pressure. Of course, caffeineism, dizziness, restlessness. Um, notice this here. How caffeinated energy drink triggered teens' heart problems. This is Men's Fitness Magazine, a review of previous research presented at the 2013 American Heart Association uh, meeting in New Orleans.
found that drinking one to three energy drinks could mess with your heart rhythm and increase your blood pressure. If severe enough, these changes could lead to irregular heartbeats or even to sudden cardiac death. Is that serious? Indeed it is. Notice uh, Harold Shirock says in his book, You and Your Health, caffeine the what? The drug contained in coffee is classed in textbooks as both a stimulant and a poison. Now, I know we have a lot of temptations today. These are things that we like to consume on the go because we have such busy lives and we don't put a lot of thought into it. But I'll tell you this, Jesus also had temptations in his day, didn't he? When he was on the cross, they offered him a mixture of a solution that would kind of deaden the type of pain he was going through. But the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He did not allow anything to desensitize his mind. Why? Because of the value he's placed upon us. And as he hangs upon there in faith, we see him now. We should place the same value, what do you say? And I tell you what, God is not asking us to give something up because we like it. Because it helps us. It doesn't. God will never ask you to give something up unless he has something better for you. You see, let me tell you why. Because your body, your physical state, it contributes to your mental health, does it not? In other words, when you feel good, you have a clear mind. We all know this, right? When you don't feel good and your body's broken down by bad health, it's hard to think clearly. And if you don't have a conducive mental uh, capacity, then you can't really have a strong spiritual life. Are you see? So the devil's trying to bring us down indirectly, indirectly, because he knows in the end of time, when the test is going to come and economic sanctions is there and every earthly support is going to be cut off, he's going to drop the big one. The big test will come. And this is the time when character will be seen. It's not a time to get ready. Now's the time to get ready. It will be a time to be ready. Now, the good news is this. It doesn't matter where we are in our walk with him. It doesn't matter how much we've abused our bodies. If we choose today to put him first in our lives, God works upon the principle of multiplication. He will bless you. He will do a miracle in your life and he will sustain your health every single day you can grow in grace. Amen? And God is there to make sure that that need is supplied and that you will realize the promise of his word. Now, human nature, we have habits, right? And I'm the world's worst. Believe me, I've been here. They say, been there, done that, right? And I have faced the Lord when he has revealed things to me that I need to give up. And I have said to myself, you know what, Lord, in, in your time, I'll do it, I'll give it up. You know what God's time is? Today is the day of salvation. When God created light, he didn't say I need a week to create light. He said, let there be light. And was there light? Was there power in his word? Indeed there was. And so the Bible says we have precious promises. That by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. That's 1 Peter chapter 1, right? So as we believe what he says and we act on what he says, will the word be fulfilled in our life? Yes. There is a struggle. Don't get me wrong. We all struggle, right? We fall. We get back up. God says, oh, a man falls seven times. The Lord is still there to pick him up. Let's not Take away from God's mercy and long-suffering towards us. He's always there. However, that does not mean that it lessens the power of the promise. We can overcome if we believe and if we put effort with God to overcome, the Bible says we'll become victorious. So we have a habit. So let's follow human nature. We take a little bit away, right? So take the H away and you have a bit. You take the A away, you still have the bit. You take the B away and you still have it. But God says, believe what I say and I will show you the power of my salvation. Amen? Now what about what we eat? Does the Bible talk about temperance today? Yes, our bodies are the temple of God. It doesn't matter, right, what we consume. We understand that. We're not going to go drink gasoline, right? Or you're not going to put salt in your gas tank of your car. So does God... The Bible says our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made. God cares about our body. He wants us to care for it as well. Now let's go to Genesis now chapter 7. I want to read a verse or two with you tonight. Genesis chapter 7. And notice here we read that when the flood came, in fact before the flood, it says in verse 2, 
There were clean animals, and friends, there were also unclean. There were animals that God did not want humans to consume at all. In fact, look at verse 2. A very clean beast, he told Noah. Thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So notice, Noah understood before the flood that there were scavengers, there were animals that were unclean in God's sight. He made them, he understands who they are, what they do, right? And then there were clean animals that God allowed them to eat because all the vegetation was destroyed by the flood. The original diet in the beginning of the Garden of Eden was uh, what God made in the garden, right? That was the original diet, but God allowed them to eat the clean animals. Now, notice how we have here in Leviticus chapter 11, God basically outlines and designates what are the clean versus the unclean. So we're going to go now to the book of Leviticus 11. Now, I want you to read with me here verse um, 20 or 46, verse 46. Notice what the Bible says in verse 46. This is the law of the beasts. It's not the law of Moses. It's not a shadow that was nailed to the cross. Are you with me? It's not a ceremonial law, if you will. It is a law of the beast. In other words, God is saying this is what is clean and this is what is unclean because he made it in the very beginning. Now let's look at chapter 11. Look now at verse 2. It says here, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which you shall eat of among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever part of the hoof and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall you eat. So the biblical test that God gave was that it has to chew the cud and have a cloven hoof. God says, this is a clean animal. So let's say a cow. Is cow clean? Yes, right? Biblically speaking, it's a clean animal. Are you with me? Yes or no? Now look at the next verse. Look at verse 4. Nevertheless, he says, These shall you not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel. Because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. Now, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, tonight you've got to go clean out the camel out of your refrigerator. Can't have it now, right? Now, we don't eat camel, at least here in the United States, but there are some people in some cultures that do, right? So we wouldn't even think of it. But listen, the camel, God says, is what? It's unclean. Now, there will be some animals we're going to read about right here quickly that you're going to think and scratch your head, why, why would God say that that's unclean? Listen, it doesn't matter. He made it, right? God said it's unclean. Is it unclean? If you ask me, the cleanest animal, Jason, outside of the Bible, right? If you had to choose with no prior knowledge of what's clean, what animal would it be? A horse. You know why? They're lean. They're friendly. They lick salt. They eat grass. They eat grain, right? But is a horse a clean animal? It's not. It simply isn't. Look at the next verse. Look at verse 4. Um, I'm sorry, verse 5. And the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the hare, even the little rabbit, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. Look at verse 7. We're going to bring it closer home now, all right? You ready for this? And the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean unto you. I can't think of any worse the most disgusting animal is the swine. Let me tell you why. I was doing a series in Kentucky, Hendersonville, Kentucky. I had a farmer come into my meetings. And he approached me after the subject. He goes, you know what? I want you to come to my farm. I want to show you something. And he had about 3,000 head of cattle. And you know, we're close to Texas, Oklahoma. You have a lot of ranches around here. You know, when they buy a piece of land, a cowboy will buy a piece of land, they'll put pigs on the land before they put cattle on the land. Do you know why they'll put pigs out there? because they want to find the rattlesnakes. You see, when the pigs find the rattlesnakes, the pigs will start playing with them because they want to eat them. But the rattlesnake will then bite the pig. But if a rattlesnake bites a cow, that cow can get deathly sick and even die, but nothing happens to the pig when the rattlesnake bites it. Do you know why? There's more poison in the pig than there is the rattlesnake. And then the pigs will eat the rattlesnake. But he told me this. He showed me, he called the cattle when it was time to feed, and they all came running when he whistled, right? And they came, and the cattle will eat the grain, and the pigs will kind of stay around the cattle. And the cattle will just get really big and full, and they'll just kind of slowly walk away from the pile of grain or the, or the hay. And the pigs will follow them because the cattle will then start to drop their waste. And the pigs will rush to the waste and will start eating it because they want it warm. 
And then the cattle would just lay down on the ground. And you know, many of them have sores on their back when the flies are all around. And the pigs will come and try to lick their sores. Now notice something. I want you to notice something. Reader's Digest. Okay, must our pork remain unsafe? Look at this. A single serving of defective pork, even a single mouthful, can kill or cripple or condemn the victim to a lifetime of aches and pains. For this unique disease, trichinosis, there is no cure. With no drugs to stop them, the worms may spread throughout the entire muscular tissues of the human body. One of the two things that happens depending on the intensity of the infection. Either death ensues or a successful effort is made by nature to throw an enclosure or cyst around each of the teeming parasites, which then become dormant, although they remain alive for years. Don't blame your doctor. All that the best doctor can do as yet is to conserve the patient's strength and try to relieve the painful local symptoms as they appear. You've heard of the trichina worm? So they can't really kill the worm unless they kill the host. And many people that go into the doctor because they're experiencing you know, joint pain, muscle pains, they think they have arthritis. Mm -mm. They have trichinosis. You get under the microscope, the other white meat, you can see that little worm lodged in there. So when you buy it, you go to the grocery store, and you see on the saran wrap, you know, make sure you cook this what? Well done. Have you seen that little sticker? Well done. Well, you take it and you cook it, cook it and cook it. Now, instead of eating live worms, you're eating what now? You're eating dead worms now. Dead worms. Now, this is uh, a, a screenshot from Fox News. And it was back in 2008. There was a young lady, maybe in her late 20s or early 30s, who had massive headaches. No history of them. So she went to the doctor. The doctor said, we don't know why. You don't have a history. We did, did some tests. Couldn't find anything wrong with her. Even did an MRI. Nothing. Last resort. I mean, they were getting worse and worse. They opened the back of her head. They, op they had surgery. You know what they pulled out of her brain? A trachina worm. And if you read the article, you can't do it because of the small font tonight on the screen. The article, the doctor said, you probably contracted this by eating the other white meat, which is pork meat. That's how, what he said. His, he said, that's how you probably got it. Now, did Daniel understand what he was talking about when Daniel saw the spread? Remember Nebuchadnezzar's table? Daniel saw what he provided for him, and Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. And the Bible says they found him ten times what? Wiser. Can we learn from the past? Yes. The Bible says whatever things were written aforetime, they were written for our learning. We can gain knowledge. You know what the Bible says? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We have to think and reason. The Bible says, come now, reason together, saith the Lord. So God has given us brains. We are to think for ourselves what is right versus what is wrong. We are to be discriminating. We are indeed to be discriminating. Newsweek, September 6, 1999. Notice, it says, a few years ago, one nutritionist said bacon wasn't technically a meat anymore. It didn't belong to any food group at all. It was a salty, nitrate-ridden, fat-laden, carcinogenic thing is what they classed it as. And today, of course, there's this mad pig disease. Now, let's go to the book of Isaiah 66. I want you to notice the biblical testimony on the importance of abstaining from this. It's not just something in the Old Testament. No, 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 no. This verse is going to be a prophecy of the last days. That's right. Right when Jesus comes the second time. Because we find in Isaiah chapter 66, friends, in verse 14, it says, And when you see this, your heart shall rejoice, and your bones shall flourish like an herb. And the hand of the Lord shall be known toward his servants, and his indignation toward his enemies. For behold, the Lord will come with fire, and with his chariots, which are the angels, right? With a whirlwind, like one, to render his anger with fury, and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many." Is it not describing his coming in power and great glory? Now drop down to verse, uh, look at verse 18. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues. It says here, and they shall come and see my what? Glory. Will every eye see him when he comes? Indeed. Now notice the verse 17. I purposely skipped the verse because in the Bible, there are many different expressions that will describe 
the wicked world. Now, we've already read all the world's going to be wandering after the beast in one verse, right? There's a verse we've already read, if you remember or not, where the Bible says they will take the words of the Lord and cast his words behind their back. In other words, they'll ignore the testimony of Scripture. There are so many different expressions to reveal the condition of the wicked in the end of time. Now, this one is unique. This one is going to describe self-idolatry. You know, today, the bottom line is what you can do for me, right? It's the dollar bill, love of money, love of materialism, self-idolatry. But the Bible gives an Old Testament expression of it. Look what it says in verse 17. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the mist. Now that represents idolatry. People would come and people would lie to them and they would take their money and they would cast what they would call blessings upon them or promise them something in the future, but they would take everything they had, play upon their ignorance. That's what that's talking about, self-idolatry. But then it says in verse 17, Eating what? Swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord, for I know their works and their thoughts, and it shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. So God clearly says in the last days many are going to be consuming and partaking of swine's flesh. Now you can go into some countries today and you can sit down and order an appetizer. And they will bring to you a, a large uh, plate with a small bowl in the middle of the plate. Now, in the bowl, there's some red hot sauce. But around the bowl of hot sauce, they have these little bitty baby mice. And they kill them when they're little bitty babies because you can see invasively, you can see inside their little paper-thin skin, right? And they have all the organs and all the veins and the little black eyeballs that are popping out. And the tails will come over the side of the plate. And people will take their little tails, they'll dip that little guy into that nice hot sauce, get him all saturated, and they'll put him in, on their tongue, open their esophagus, and let that little guy just slip down to their stomach. Some people like to chew him up. It's true. Now that's disgusting, isn't it? But I want you to note something. In God's eyes... There's no difference between the mouse and what? And the swine. Do you see how he categorizes them together? He says the mouse and the swine. Look at chapter 65 of Isaiah. Isaiah 65. The Lord is the same yesterday, today, and what? And forever. This is describing the end of time, in fact. Look at Isaiah 65. We're going to look at verse 2. God says, I've spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. You see what they're doing? They're departing from it. They're choosing their own way, not God's way. And then God says here, A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens, and burneth incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves, and lodge in the monuments, they eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things in their vessels. The Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Are you a vessel for God? Am I a vessel? We are the temple of God. And God says, glorify God in your bodies which belong to the Lord. They are Christ. Now look at that little guy. That's Zuzu, by the way. That's my daughter's hamster that passed away. She was very close to him. I said, I'll give Zuzu her five minutes of fame. I'll put him up on the screen. Put her up on the screen, right? But you can go to uh, even New York today. And this is off a credible news source here. Rat meat is what's for dinner. There are restaurants in America that are now serving Rat meat. I think we can get a pretty good idea of what God thinks about that. Um, but I want you to come back with me to the book of Leviticus chapter 11. Notice something else. Leviticus chapter 11. And being raised in southern Louisiana, you know, we pride ourselves, the Cajuns down there, of um, what we eat. We will eat anything that doesn't eat us first, right? Have you been to New Orleans, the French Quarter? There's a lot of menu options, right? Most you probably want to stay away from. But in Leviticus chapter 11, look at verse 9. It says here, These shall you eat of all that are in the waters, whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters and the seas, and in the rivers, them shall you eat. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and the rivers, of all that move in the waters and of any living thing, which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. So notice God says there's clean fish, and obviously did Jesus eat fish on the Sea of Galilee? Yes, but it was clean fish. Then you have the unclean fish. The unclean fish are made as scavengers to clean the waste of the bottom of the waters. For example, on every corner in Louisiana, southern that is, 
you have a catfish house. Catfish does not have any scales. It's a bottom feeder. In fact, I remember going to a Thai restaurant once. We like Thai food. And I took my little girl, my, my Abigail, who was younger then, to the aquarium that was there, a large aquarium. It was crystal clear, but you know what? There was no fish in it. So we're looking for fish. There was only one fish, a little catfish on the bottom. So we asked the waiter to answer a few questions. How come you don't have any fish in here? She goes, well, we're cleaning it, and then we'll put the fish back in. You know what? They were saving money. They didn't have to buy all the chemicals. They just put that little guy in there, and guess what? Like a little vacuum, right? He just cleans and eats everything on the bottom. So all the waste from the birds and the fowls of the air and the animals that drop their waste in the lagoons and rivers, right, that just drop to the bottom, the catfish, that's why they get so large, they eat all of that waste. Are you with me? And yet, God says, don't, it's not for human consumption. You see, that's not what God wants us to consume. So the test, it has to have fins and scales, or the Bible says it is unclean. Now, the biggest shrimp you can find in the Gulf of Mexico is where the Mississippi River flows into the Gulf because they actually put all the waste into the Gulf around that area. They'll, they'll find the biggest shrimp. The shrimp are like the catfish of the sea. Lobster, etc., shellfish, it's all unclean. They're scavengers. They're made as filters to clean all the waste that goes indeed into the water. Notice hundreds poison and province-wide shellfish scare. Now, does it taste good? Perhaps it does, but that's not justification, right, to consume it. And let me tell you why, because God has made some wonderful things, hasn't he? He has made, given this world abundance of provisions of good food that's healthy to the body, giving us clear minds. In fact, God wants us to have longevity, doesn't he? God's not taking something away because it tastes good. God is saying, listen, I want you to have long life and I want you to have it more abundantly. He understands the end from the beginning. He knows what we need. In 1988, nearly 300,000 Chinese in Shanghai developed hepatitis A from clams. And even among the clean animals today, is our world polluted at large? Let's be honest, is it polluted? Even today, secular people, not even Christians, are saying, you know what, we need to abstain from this because of the mercury and the diseases that are just taking the animal kingdom by storm today. And yet it's, 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 it's transferred, of course, and many people are sick today. Mad cow disease. Notice it says in Newsweek of March 12, 2001, mad cow is the creepiest in a family of disorders that can make Ebola look like chicken pox. Isn't that interesting? CWD, chronic wasting disease among the deer and the elk. The World Health Organization declares that one-third of the world is sick today. And the reason why so many are sick is simple. Many want to live how they want to live, eat what they want to eat without any discrimination, and they feel like they can go to the doctor and get something that will take care of the symptoms. In other words, you have what you find is um, what we need is 95%, you know, they want 95% cure and 5% prevention, right? When the Bible says, I'm giving you preventive measures, if you just obey me, God says, if you just follow what I say, I will bless you. I'll keep you away from the diseases. I'll keep you away from the things that are tearing your health down, right? Follow my biblical plan, and I'll show you the blessing and the salvation of God. What do you say? And friends, can we trust the word of God? Many people don't want to take the sacrifice, but I tell you, we're not sacrificing. What are we giving up for him? There's nothing we're giving up in comparison to what he gave up for us. He gave his life, and the Bible says... He wants to be with us every single step of the way and give us even something better. Now, you may be thinking right now, well, Brother Jason, what about Acts 10? Didn't God tell Peter that the unclean were now clean? Well, let's go to Acts 10 and find out if he said that. Look at Acts chapter 10. Let's read it for ourselves. Acts 10, and together we'll read here the story of Peter. Peter had many problems. Of course, Peter was one of those disciples that often would speak before he would think. We know that, right? impulsive. And Peter, though, was prejudiced. Remember how Paul had to rebuke the apostle Peter because he didn't want to eat with the Gentiles? He was embarrassed. So Paul found him in that condition. And he rebuked him. He says, what are you doing? You know the Lord Jesus Christ never taught in this line. He came to bring all together under one, right, in Jesus Christ. And so Peter was humble enough to take the rebuke, and it changed him. 
But still, he needed another illustration. So Peter is up on the housetop, on the seaside. He's hungry, the Bible says. He's almost starving. And he's sleeping. He falls into a trance. At the very same time, miles away, Cornelius was a Gentile, but a believer. And he had some buddies with him, and so they were wanting to know the truth. And so an angel appeared to Cornelius and said, you need to go to Peter and bring him here. He will instruct you about the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows enough. And so Cornelius said, I'm going to do it. So he sent a messenger to find out where Peter was and knocked on the door. So let's fast forward now. Let's go to where Peter was. Look at chapter 10 and look at verse 7. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had cleared all these things unto them, or de I'm sorry, declared, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. He became very what? Hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Did Peter mean what he said when he says, I've never eaten this? Yes, he meant it. Did he walk with Jesus for three and a half years? If Peter didn't eat it, what about Jesus? He didn't eat the unclean, did he? You understand that? So Peter knows this, so that's why he's confused. What do you mean? You know better than this. I never ate that. You never ate this. And then the Lord says to Peter a second time. Look at verse 15. And the voice spake unto him again the second time. What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done three times, and the vessel was perceived up again into heaven. Now look at verse 17. Now you would think, listen, if God told you something as simple as that three times, would you get it? I'd get it. Would you get it? God said it three times. You would think Peter would say, okay, I got it now. But notice verse 17. Peter responds by saying, now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, did Peter take it literally? That God was sanctioning the consumption of unclean animals? Never. He's like, what is God trying to teach me out of this, right? Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. So they came, knocked on the door. Is there a Simon Peter here? Yeah, he's upstairs. He's asleep, though. He's hungry. He's about to eat right now. The women are preparing food. Please call him down. So Peter comes down. He faces these Gentiles. And they say, please come, an angel appear to us, and will you preach to us? We want to know more about your Savior, Jesus. Did Peter take him up on the offer? Yes, he did. So Peter gets ready. He goes with them. He comes into the house of all the Gentiles, and they simply bow down and start worshiping Peter because they knew that he walked with Jesus for three and a half years. And notice the response of Peter. Look at chapter 10, and look at verse 25. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up. I myself also am what? I'm just a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said to them, so Peter's speaking now, and he said, You know how that is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath shown me that I should not call any what? man, common or unclean. What was God telling Peter? Do not class the Gentiles as unclean. For God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell upon the face of the earth. Amen? That's what it says in Acts 17. And so he wasn't sanctioning the consumption of unclean animals. He was just getting his attention and yet a text out of its context is simply a pretext, right? Everything must be understood in the right context. In fact, come with me now to 2 Timothy chapter. Let's look at chapter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Can we go there? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now, often the Apostle Paul writes about the Antichrist. Remember how Paul said, After his departure shall grievous wolves enter in among the church, not sparing the flock. He even said the mystery of iniquity was already working inside. That man was developing this spirit of, of intolerance and that they were placing themselves where God should be and how the church would fall away from the truth and that man of sin would be revealed. 
in the church, right? In the temple of God. We've read this already. So often he wrote Timothy and others about this future falling away within the church. The iron and the clay, the little horn, right? The beast. And notice what he says here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the spirit which speaks through the word, right? Speaketh expressly that in the latter times. What time? The latter times. Some shall depart from the faith. Why? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines or teachings of devils. Contrary to the word of God. Coming from the devil himself. And notice what they're going to be teaching. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. Now what is lies and hypocrisy? Saying one thing and doing another, right? And what they say is lies. It's not true. In other words, it's with the pretense of Christianity. But there's no truth to it at all. And then it says, look at verse 2. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Verse 3. Forbidding to marry. Tell me something, friends, today. Have we seen the dark and ill fruits of this? Abuse, abstinence, right? Can't marry, priest. You with me now? So it's a doctrine of devils. The Bible says man and woman shall be one. Amen? And yet they have perverted that. And we see the results of it. Look, and abstaining from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. You know, on Fridays, I don't know what it is, you can or can't eat fish, or you can't eat fish on Fridays, you know, abstaining from what God has given to be good, right? Now look at the next verse. Look at the next verse. It says, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. I'm going to stop right there. Now if you read that one verse right there, you would think, there it is, right? Every and anything that God has ever made under the sun can be consumed. That's it right there. How can you refute that? Okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to invite you to my place, my cabin up in the mountains of Montana. As my guest of honor, we're going to make our famous rat stew. We're going to put all the unclean little guys in there. Snakes, we'll cut them up, put them in. Supplement the spaghetti. You understand that? Put the little babies in there, little snakes, and just rats and mice and all the bugs in there. And we'll, we'll just put some Zatarans, hot sauce in there, right? And we'll just get it nice and spicy so it doesn't taste as bad. Who wants to be my first guest? Who wants to come and try that, right? You know what, friends? Like I said before, reading a verse and building a doctrine out of one verse, it's detrimental, isn't it? Look at the next verse. The very next verse, it says here, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now the word sanctified means set aside, right? So does the Bible sanctify what's good and what's bad? Does God set aside what we can eat versus what we can't eat? Yes, he gives the biblical rule, the biblical mandate. But he says, hey, it must be sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. You know what the most important thing about tonight is? Listen, God wants us to be healthy, doesn't he? He wants us to live longer. And let me tell you, the longer you live, the more happy and conducive life you have with each other and with those around you and with the Lord Jesus Christ, the more of a witness you can be to the world. The more you can draw people to Jesus Christ, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. These are principles to help us, not to restrict us. Not to restrict us, but to help us. We need him more than we need anything, right? And God knows what our bodies need. And I tell you what, friends, it is a struggle. You don't think I don't know that? I understand that sometimes the things we have to give up, we're so used to, human nature, we struggle. But don't ever give up. Jesus has something better for us. And I can testify, standing up here tonight, that the things we're learning, I have learned before. And there's some things I struggle with, but I moved out. I said, Lord, if you said it, I'm going to believe it. I'm not going to trust my own feelings and my own emotions and what people say to me. I'm going to follow you. And you know what? I have never felt better in my life. It is amazing how God can quicken the mind and give you a clear mind and a healthy body if you just follow the biblical principles of health, right? And then you know what? When people are struggling and they, they look to you and they want help, they have need, then you can share with them. Look, this is what God did for me. He can do it for you. There's no respect of persons. He loves you just as much. And then we, the work will spread like wildfire. We'll lift people from the degradation of sin, right? And ill choices. And even though we've made bad choices, 
It doesn't matter where we are now. Don't look behind you. Look ahead. Are you with me? Look ahead. Just think of the benefits that you will reap by following the health principles of God's word. The money you can save, the longevity, the healthy mind that we can have. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us such clear rules from your word of how we can have healthy bodies, clear minds, and prepare our souls for heaven. This is ultimately what we want and what you want. And we know that you love us so much that, Lord, you will not withhold any good thing from us, is what the Bible says. So bless us as we go our separate ways. Give these people here tonight strength and encouragement to make the right decision for their futures. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.